answer is yes, he is beautiful. Absolutely, absolutely. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and we turn it to Revelation chapter 2 as we continue in our series, The Seven Churches of Revelation. As we look at this, we're beginning to see a progression taking place and the level of disobedience to Christ seems to be increasing uh, as Jesus addresses the different churches that are there. And we're going to see this in this particular church, uh, that there's actually a person there that's called out, uh, given a name, in fact, uh, a name that has many connotations to it. But as you're turning there, have you ever hung around with somebody, maybe from your youth or whatever, and they were just a, a bad influence in your life? Anybody? Have, you hung out with them and you seemed to get in more trouble when you hung out with whoever. And it didn't matter what it was. Maybe some it was just some innocent trouble, but maybe it was just real trouble. Uh, what is it? You know, you're judged by the company you keep, or it only takes one bad apple to what? Spoil the bunch. And, you know, well, it takes only, what, a little bit of leaven to, to leaven the whole lump. Uh, and so we have to be careful sometimes of the influences we let into our lives. We have to be careful sometimes with even some of the people that we hang out with. You know, there's some people that will lead us astray if we're not careful. And that's what John is being told here in this particular uh, revelation uh, that is for the church at Thyatira. Uh, that there's something that's going on there that they need to be aware of and they need to deal with and deal with quickly or else the consequences are going to be dire. The consequences are going to be severe. And so, again, if you have your Bibles, let's stand in honor of God's Word and let's read this message to this church, uh, beginning in Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. It says, And to the angel of the church at Thyatira, write these things, says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have these things against you because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with the rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, and praise you for this passage of scripture. Lord, apply it to our hearts that we may live it out in this world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Yeah, think about this. When Jesus is introducing himself, obviously he's going back to some things that were identified in chapter 1. If you notice, every time he introduces himself to a church, he's pulling something that he was revealed about him in chapter 1. And in this particular one, it says something very interesting and unique. It says, these things says the Son of God. That's the only time the term Son of God is used in the book of Revelation. It, it's a focus on His deity. In, in Revelation chapter 1, He refers to Himself as the Son of Man, right? It's one identifying with humanity. But here it says Son of God. It's kind of like, uh oh, pay attention. He's not coming as meek and mild little, you know, shepherd boy kind of thing. No, He's coming as... King of kings and Lord of lords. So he identifies himself as Son of God, focusing upon his divinity, the fact that he is fully God, 100%, while at the same time being fully man in every way except for sin. But notice this, that he also says there, who has eyes like a flame of fire. Whoa. 
I don't know about you, but if I saw somebody with eyes like flames of fire, I don't think I would be all cuddly with him, right? I don't think I would be all uh, just warm and fuzzy, so to speak. It's a point that his gaze is penetrating, and he sees and he knows everything. In fact, he sees and knows everything in our hearts and minds, even before we do it. He knows us. It's a reference to the fact that he is coming in judgment when he's speaking to this particular church. And when you look at what's taking place, you see why. But also, he's got what? Feet like burning brass. Uh, he points at his feet like fine brass. He's swift. He's quick. He's coming. Judgment is sure. So this is how he introduces himself to his church, to his bride. He's the son of God. He's got eyes that are like flames of fire. He's got feet like fine brass. This, he, he's coming. And it's not a picture again of this small little boy in a manger. No, it's, it's, he's coming as victor, as king. So what does he have to say to them? And just like in the other particular ones, he has different issues. Uh, that he brings to the part, to the forefront, things that they have done well. And so when Jesus speaks to the church at Thyatira, he knows their abundant good works. He knows their abundant good works. He says, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. As for your works, the last are more than the first. Wow, that, that sounds pretty good. They, they, they seem to be doing all right. I mean, you think about the church at, at Ephesus. Uh, they were a church that was holding to sound doctrine, but they lacked love, right? They didn't have any love. You see, the church at Smyrna, they were what? Being faithful and persecuted. He didn't really have anything to correct for them. They were actually doing what they were supposed to be doing. Then we see the church at Pergamon, as we saw last week, they were faithful, but there was some false teaching that was taking place there. But here we see that, yes, they're, they're doing well with this, but we're going to find out that there are more people participating in false teaching here than previous before, and that you see a pattern that's taking place. In fact, at Smyrna, it says that there was, what, a synagogue of Satan. And at Pergamum, it says there was the throne of Satan. And then later, here we see that they talk about what the deep things of Satan. You see a, a progression that's taking place. There is more wickedness that's being revealed. And Jesus is going to confront that. But before he confronts all that, he actually points out, you're doing some good things. You have love. Notice the church of Ephesus didn't have any love. It says, you have love. Love for God and love for others. Now, these are the faithful ones, not the ones that are going after the false teachers. These are the ones that are being true to Christ. These are the ones that are being uh, faithful in their daily walk with the Lord. But notice, if you have love, what follows is service. If you truly love God and you love others, you're going to what? Serve other people. You're not going to serve yourself. And so he says, I know your works, your what? Your love. And right after that, he says, what? Your service. So they were taking care of one another. They were encouraging one another. They were showing brotherly kindness and affection for one another. Hey, that is to be commended. In fact, in the early church history, that was one of the things that stood out to the pagan world was, wow, these people actually like each other. Not just that, they, they love each other. And that should be a hallmark of every church, that we should be known for loving one another. Even when we disagree over things, we can what? We can still love one another. We can still care for one another. So they have love, and that leads to what? Service. Then he says, you, all, you also have faith. He says, you have faith. I know your works, your love, your service, your faith. There are those who are staying true to the gospel. There are those who are staying true to what it means to truly understand and know uh, Jesus Christ. They understand the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus and what that means in life. So they are faithful. And if you are faithful, guess what that leads to is perseverance. If you are persevering, he says, I know your service, your faith, your patience, or your what? Perseverance. They're sticking to it. They're holding fast to the Word of God. And I'm telling you what, we're living in a culture that is trying to tell us, don't listen to this. 
We're living in a culture that says this is old and antiquated and it has no business determining what's right or wrong in our culture. I want you to know Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This word is just as applicable today as when it was first penned many centuries ago. And so hold fast. That's what he's saying. You're being faithful and you're what? You're persevering. And you think of people in places of persecution. What makes them persevere? It's faithfulness. It, it's holding to what God has revealed. And then even this, he points this out. This is commendable. He says at the end of verse 19, he says, the last are more than the first. He says, your works that you're doing now are more than when you first started. They're, they're actually making progress in the faith. So let me ask you this. Are you making progress in your faith? Or are you still stuck with the same issues that you've had 10, 15, 20 years ago? Is your life different from when you first came to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? It, it, it better be. There better be some difference in you as a result of following Jesus Christ. There better be a market a transformation in your life. Not that you're going to be perfect, but are you making progress? And he says your works are more than at the first. So these that are faithful there at uh, Thyatira, they're actually making progress in the faith. Again, these are the ones that are being faithful. These aren't the ones that are uh, uh, going off and following false teaching. And my point is, are you making progress in your faith? And if you're not, then examine your heart and say, why, why am I not making progress? What, what is this? And I, it may be different for different individuals. But the point is, He has given us everything we need to know what it, He wants us to do. He's given us everything we need for godliness. And so let us identify, forsake that sin that's keeping us from making progress and cling to Almighty God. And so when Jesus speaks to the church at Thyatira, he knows their abundant good works. But he also knows their adultery with the false teacher. Their adultery with the false teacher. And that's a strong word to use there. Their adultery. But it is. They have gone after something else. They've gone after someone else other than the Lord. He says, nevertheless, in verse 20, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So we don't know who this woman is, but she is a self-appointed prophetess. Calls herself a prophetess. God says, I didn't send her. And she's teaching falsehood. This is not according to the what God has laid out for his pattern. But they tolerated it. How long this has been going on, we don't know. But it's interesting, they call, Jesus calls her Jezebel. You know from the Old Testament, Jezebel, that's just the name that every Jewish family named their little girls, right? No, you, you did not name a kid Jezebel. I mean, that, that you just marked that kid out for an old boy. Jezebel was a pagan queen in the Old Testament time. Uh, married Ahab, turned Ahab away from the God of Israel. Uh, a lot of wickedness, immorality associated with Jezebel. I mean, she, oh man. I mean, even Elijah, this is this is the influence that Jezebel had in the Old Testament. Elijah beats the 450 prophets of Baal. Not Elijah, but God, through Elijah, beats the 450 prophets of Baal. It begins to rain again. Everyone's rejoicing. And Jezebel says, I'm going to get you, Elijah. And what does Elijah do? He's just had this massive victory. And he runs. <laughs> he runs. He gets out of town like a long way away. That was Jezebel. And so for Jesus to identify this woman as a Jezebel, it, it, it's, this is serious. So what is she doing? Most likely what she is doing is telling people it's okay to go along with the culture. It's okay to be just like the culture around you because, hey, we're in Christ. Our, our soul is saved, but our bodies can do whatever we want. Basically, and there are people who think that, well, I got saved, but hey, I can still go out and carouse and drink and do everything else, and I can just live like the world. But probably even more specific, one of the things that Thyatira was known for was its trade guilds. Basically, it'd be like labor unions in our day and time, but trade guilds 
Uh, they had them for everything. Uh, in fact, we encounter someone over in the book of Acts, a woman named Lydia, who was from Thyatira, and she was what? A seller of what? Purple. And so in Thyatira, they had wool dyeing. Uh, they, these are the different guilds they had. They had wool workers, linen workers, makers of outer garments, dyers, leather workers, tanners, potters, bakers, slave dealers, uh, bronze workers. I mean, on and on and on. If you had a trade, you had a guild. You had a group that you were part of. And you know what was part of this guild? If you wanted to work and have work, you had to go. And they had these banquets. And at these banquets, guess what? There would be a patron god of leatherworking. There'd be a patron god of bronze working. There'd be a patron god of this or a patron god of that. And so you had to go to these little banquets and basically participate in a pagan ritual. And part of that ritual was sexual immorality. And so Jezebel is probably telling these Christians, hey, it's okay, it's because it's your job. Hey, you need to go, go ahead and go to these trade deal banquets and participate fully and it'll be okay. And people were like, well, hey, that sounds like a good deal. I'm going to do that. I'm not going to be any different than the world. And Jesus says, no, <laughs> no, that's a Jezebel. Now, isn't that what this world is like right now? Aren't there people who think they can just, well, let me come to church on Sunday and I can clean up good on Sunday. But the rest of the week, let me just live how I want. I'm going to blend in with the world, not be any different than the world. And worse than that, sometimes we, we bring the world into the church. We just bring it on in and it just, it just seeps in and we don't see any problems with it. We must be careful because following false teaching is adultery. It's adultery. It's, it's leading astray. And so he said, notice this. He says, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Think about the kindness of God. In Romans chapter 2, verse 4, it talks about the kindness of God. The goodness of God is to lead us, what, to repentance. He says, I gave her an opportunity. I've let her know that this is wrong, and I've given her an opportunity to repent. It's mercy. And hasn't God done that for you and for me? Given us opportunity to repent over and over again by His kindness and His mercy. He said, I gave her time to repent. You know, there's some people who think that because God hadn't sent His judgment on them that He's not going to judge them. That's not. God is not slow. God is faithful in keeping His promises. Years ago, there was an atheist who was a very outspoken atheist. And he, you know, would do this little thing with his students at school you know, on a university campus. And he would say, you know, if there's really a God, and he must strike me because if I blaspheme him, he must strike me. Because I'm blaspheming his name. And so he goes on this tirade and he blasphemes the name of God. He doesn't say he doesn't exist. All this kind of stuff. And he says, so if God really exists, I'm going to give him an opportunity to strike me dead. And so he would sit back for like four or five minutes and just be silent. Waiting for God to strike him dead because he had blasphemed. And of course, you know, People are like, oh, wow, God must not exist because God didn't blast him right then and there. When some faithful pastor heard about this, he says, does Mr. whatever the professor's name is, does he really think that he can exhaust the patience of God in four to five minutes? Think about that. Can you exhaust the patience of God in four? I am grateful God is long-suffering. I am grateful that God is patient with us. But there's going to come an end to it. And he's, this is what Jesus is telling. I gave her time to repent. That now she's going to pay the price. Now she's going to pay. He says, indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed. And those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Unless they repent of their deeds. Repent. Repent of sacrificing to idols. Bowing down to something else. Repent of what? Sexual immorality. You might even say, well, what is sexual immorality? I mean, in our culture, it's this or it's like that. 
Sexual immorality is anything that's against the ideal of God. And so what is the ideal that God has established in His Word? That sex, sexual relations, is reserved for marriage between one man and one woman for life. I mean, that's the ideal. Obviously, that's what God has ordained. And so anything that is not that is sexual immorality. And it covers a whole host of things in our culture. And you look around. Sometimes there's divorce and remarriage. That could be considered adultery. Obviously, is it forgivable? Absolutely. By all means, certainly. It certainly is. But you know, we're living a culture which says anything goes. Whatever you want to do sexually, identify whatever. It can be whatever you want it to be. No, that's sexual immorality. I encourage you to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. And the Apostle Paul, in fact, let's, let's look at it real fast. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth, which is dealing with some of these same issues at the church of Thyatira. He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's a long list. And sometimes we only focus on one or two words in there. But you need to pay attention to all of those words. Because all of those are sin. We try to pick this sin or that sin, but they are all sin. And notice what Paul says as he concludes that. And such were some of you. Isn't that great? Such were some of you. They repented of it. They repented of their extortion. They repented of their reviling. They repented of stealing. They repented of uh, uh, covetousness, of sexual immorality, and on and on. He says, but you were what? Washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. They had repented of those things. They had turned from those things and turned to the living God. And that's what Jesus is telling the church at Thyatira. Repent. Turn. He says, otherwise, I'm coming. And it's not going to be pretty. Verse 23, he says, I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one according to your works. Whoa. You mean God might kill somebody? Yeah. You ever heard of Ananias and Sapphira in the, old, in the book of Acts? They lied to the Holy Spirit. And they dropped dead. Oh my goodness. What if every time we sin, we risk dropping dead? Oh my goodness. I'm grateful for the grace of God. <laughs> I am grateful because, man, none of us can stand, right? None of us would have any hope. But Jesus just making the point that adultery with the false teacher is serious business. And he's warning this church. He's telling this church, you've got a false teacher in the midst of you, and you are embracing it, and you are following it. You're being seduced by it. He says, repent. He said, I don't want to have to come and do this. But he will. I think it's sad to note that church history shows that this church died out in the end of the second, before the end of the second century. They had fallen prey to another false teaching that had come through. It's called the Montanist, and we don't have time to, to go through that whole group. But church history shows that this church, by the end of the second century, was no longer there because it coddled false teaching. So Jesus, when he speaks to the church at Thyatira, he knows their abundant good works, and he knows their adultery with the false teacher. But he also knows their victory in holding fast. He knows what awaits them if they will hold fast. There's, there's a victory for being faithful. And it's not your victory, it's the victory of Christ. It's what he gives and what he shares with us. And so, look with me in verse 24. Now to you I say and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine. 
So he's speaking to the faithful ones, to the ones who are holding fast, to the ones who aren't sacrificing to idols, who aren't committing sexual immorality. He says, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say. I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. So no other burden. He's saying, remember up there at the beginning, your love, your service, your faith, your patience. He's saying, stick to that. Say, stay true to that. And that's what he's telling us is hold fast Jesus Christ. Hold fast to him. And I'll tell you, there are times in life when it's hard to hold fast. When the whole world again is saying, this is crazy. This is closed minded. This is hate speech. You know, there's a tendency in us to say, well, well maybe, maybe I just want to talk about Jesus. Maybe, maybe I'll just keep this all to myself right now. That's what the adversary wants. He doesn't want us to share the gospel. He doesn't want us to speak about the good news of Jesus Christ. We're to hold fast and trust Him. You know, there's some things in life that are just beyond our, our pay grade, so to speak. I, I can't figure out a whole lot of things in this world. I used to think I could, right? You, when you were young, yeah, didn't you think you knew it all? Then you figured out how much you really didn't know I tell you, the more I learn, the less I know in some ways. But you know, we just have to trust God in times like this. With everything that's going on in our world, with the, the COVID-19, racial injustice, I mean, we need to ask God to show us, you know, how you're working in the midst of this. Show us, Lord, how to be faithful. Lord, show us how to hold fast to your word. And I just want to encourage you, church, Hold fast. Hold fast to the gospel. This word is, is true. We can believe what Jesus has told us. We can hold fast knowing that he is with us each and every step of the way. You know, it, it, it's persevered even when it hurts. Even when it hurts. i tell you, one of the best scenes in a movie that I ever saw was the movie Facing the Giants. I don't know if you remember that movie. It was done by the Kendrick Brothers. Uh, they used, actually, this is one of their earlier movies, so they actually used church members to make this movie. And I tell you, it's a fantastic movie about a football team. But there's a scene in there where you know, he's trying to get the kids to buy into his philosophy, and they're not wanting to do it. And he challenges this guy who's basically like the leader of the team to do what's called the dead man crawl. And it's where a football player gets on all fours, and he puts someone on his back, and he has to crawl on just all fours, you know, not on his knees, but on hands and his toes to see how far he can go. And in that movie, the guy says, he challenges, hey, do you think you can go 10 yards carrying so-and-so on your back? He says, oh, yeah, but coach, I can do 10 yards. Can you do 20? Yeah, I can do 20 yards. I right? says, well, I want you to do it, but do it blindfolded. So he puts a blindfold on him, and he starts to walk. And he starts to go. And as he's going, it's kind of like the coach is telling him, hey, keep going. Keep going. You, you got this. He says, how much further, coach? No, no, keep going. Don't stop. It's hurting, coach. It hurts. No, no, keep, keep going. Keep going. And it's just this scene. And I tell you, this guy just wants to give up. And he wants to quit. But the coach keeps saying, go. It's just a little bit further. Keep going. Keep going. Finally, he says, you made it. At the end, he didn't do 20 yards. He did 100 yards. Because the coach was telling him, hang in there. Hold fast. Persevere. Keep, keep going. And that's what Jesus is telling us. Hold fast, believer. Hold fast, church. Persevere, follower of Christ. He is with us. And he's encouraging us. And I want to encourage you as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you and, and praise you for today. Thank you that, Lord, we can hold fast to you because you hold fast to us. Lord, the victory that we have, you, you promised to give them the morning star. That's what you promised the church. That's that they would help rule the nations. Sharing in this victory you have. Lord, the fact that it says you would give us the morning star, you, Lord Jesus, are the morning star. That's what you tell us in Revelation 22. 
we get to be with you. What a wonderful blessing. What a wonderful thing to look forward to, to have that, um, what we know by faith, to, to know by sight. But Lord, there are times when it's just difficult. And Lord, sometimes we try to understand with you know, false teaching. Lord, give us wisdom and discernment to, to know what is true and what is false. Lord, forgive us when we've gone after that which is false. We've gone after idols. Lord, we've gone after sexual immorality. Lord, cleanse us. Lord, just cleanse us. And that is the hope. And that is the assurance we have in Christ. So, Lord, if there's anyone here today that's just struggling and they just hold, in one sense just want to give up, Lord, may they hold fast. Hold fast to you. And, Lord, just may you surround them and encourage them and just continue to tell them you can do it. And, Lord, I believe that's what you're telling us today. Lord, if there's anyone here that's never trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray that, Lord, that today would be the day of salvation. That they would turn from what they're trusting in now and turn to Christ. So, Lord, if there's someone that they need to pray this, they would say, Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know that my sin separates me from you, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and in my place. So, I turn from my sin and I turn to Jesus. And ask that Jesus you come into my life and make me a new person from the inside out. And Lord, if that is someone's desire, I pray they would begin to, to grow in the faith. They would seek out, Lord, what it means to, to follow Jesus. And Lord, I pray that all of us here today could say that we're making progress in the faith. That Lord, maybe we get fits and starts, but Lord, our desire is to be more like you each day. Lord, just show us how we need to respond. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.